I first heard about Candida auris probably about a year, year and a half ago. There was a certain degree of alarm, certainly. My first thought was, I've never heard of this and would I have recognized it if I had had it. This is the first time I've seen an emergent species of yeast that is masquerading as a Candida, which is such a common pathogen, but carries such a major implication compared to all the other yeasts we've had before. So I would say this is a first in my career. We've had a very simplistic approach to identification of yeast for many years. Mainly it was by morphology. We saw what it looked like on a plate, we saw what it looked like under a microscope, and we called it a candida species or an aspergillus or some other type of fungus. The identification of fungi has lagged well behind the identification of bacteria because it was really never necessary. I think we've concentrated so much on multidrug resistant bacteria over the last 10, 20 years, and I've certainly not been surprised by anything that has happened with bacteria, that it's been naive that we weren't worried about a more resistant fungal pathogen. So it just brought it home that it has happened and gee, shouldn't we have known this was coming? I think most people don't even realize candida is what causes diaper rash. I mean, candida is part of our lives from the time we're infants. So we don't really think of it as a pathogen. We just think of it as something we coexist with. And in settings in the hospital, for many years, we've realized that candida can become invasive. But we've always had drugs that could kill it. And we rarely saw people dying of such a fungal infection. When we started doing bone marrow transplants and more high-level immunocompromised care, we started seeing species of fungus that would not be a pathogen in most situations starting to get into people and do major harm, and we understood those risks. What we didn't understand is that our garden variety genus Candida was suddenly going to become untreatable in a certain percentage of people, and that's really what we're sensing with this Candida auris organism. It should not be dismissed as something we just know everything about and will succumb to the average antifungal. So now we're recognizing that every Candida species that we do isolate, we need to do further testing. And if we can't do those in our own hospital, we should send them out to reference labs that can look at them to make sure that they are not a pathogen like this. Identification of this organism is a problem. And the CDC has been very helpful in that they've given us a number of names of organisms that may commonly be confused with Candida auris. None of those organisms are organisms we see every day, but we all have access, either on site or through reference labs, to some fairly sophisticated ways of identifying yeast now and we may get a report of an organism that we've never heard of and assume, you know, do some reading that it is not necessarily going to be resistant. But because the CDC has given us quite a few of these organisms' names, we now recognize that we should think twice about this because they might have been misidentified and we should not assume that the usual antifungal is going to work against those organisms because in Candida auris, it is resistant to a lot of our usual antifungal agents. I think that we have to understand that most of our fungal infections that the average host in a hospital setting has trouble with is a fungus that they came in with, that it lived in their body already. This organism is a little different because at least our body of information about it now suggests that it's living in the environment of a hospital and that when that same patient comes in and has a puncture of some sort, like an incision or an intravenous line, that this organism may be picked up from their environment. And of course, all of us, professionals as well as patients, are very frightened about acquiring an infection in the hospital. And that's this type of organism from what we know now. Well, I don't think it's posing any threat to the general population, but when you realize that most of us at some point in our lives will be hospitalized, perhaps for a major surgery or a major illness, 
at some point in all of our lives, we might be at least temporarily at risk of this organism, especially if it becomes as widespread as it has the potential to do. Hi, my name is Kelvin, and I work on the team that creates the content that you've just seen, Medscape TV. If you like the content and want to see more, click on the button to the right, and it'll take you to the full series.